after that time. So he started this whole idea of chemistry and that chemistry is a particular study. It's a study of everything that has both mass and volume. If you did the reading for this morning, pages one through seven, I mean, this, is, this isn't a hard concept, right? And yesterday we talked about fish and questioned, do fish realize that they're in water? Now, we're never really going to know unless at some point we can figure out a way to have this mind, Vulcan mind meld with a aquatic species, right? They'll say, hey, do you really know you're in water? And they go, water? What's water? Um, but do we understand that when we are in air, that we are actually in something as opposed to nothing? I want you to think about that. Because when we talk about chemistry, stuff that has volume and mass, we need to recognize that we are continually in the middle of an environment that is actually full of volume and mass. The first two experiments in the book are, are kind of simplistic, but I think they're important to kind of drill this point home that air, since it's the most dominant thing we're in and yet the thing we tend to consider the least, is actually something, not nothing. Which, I mean, that, that makes sense to you, right, when you think about it. Air is something, not nothing. One of the coolest things that I think about chemistry is that though air is something, not nothing, most of everything that's something is actually nothing. L let me have fun with this class, okay? I'm not going to keep looking back at you, Savannah, but Savannah's heard all this stuff before. But these are the kind of things that I really enjoy thinking about because we're going to learn that as we take stuff, and that's the technical term I use in here, stuff, that matter is really a degree of what Mr. Baker might call stuffness. How much stuff is in it is what, how, when we measure matter, when we measure mass, we're determining how much stuff there is. That ultimately all stuff is made up of the same building blocks, the same things. And as we take this look at things and we go from the large scale, the things that we can actually see, you know, there's larger scales. The scale is so huge we don't even recognize them. I remember when I was a probably in elementary school, our family went down to Cape Canaveral. And we were driving by these large buildings where they build the rockets back then. You know, they had huge rockets, stand-up rockets, and they built them in these large buildings. And then the whole side of the building opened up and the rocket rolled out. It's kind of cool. And as we drove by, the bus driver t pointed to one of the corners of the building and see this huge indent. I said, what happened there? I said, well, a bus ran into it. A bus ran into it. What happened? Um, the driver didn't see it. You're standing back going, this is a massive building. How could you not see it? Well, the reason the driver didn't see it was not because its scale was so small, but because its scale was so large that they lost perspective on it. Okay? So we're going to look at certain things at a very large scale. As you look around this room, for some of the other classes, they've got pictures of the universe and the solar system and things like that. The scale is massive compared to where we are. And yet on the other side of that, we have a scale which is much smaller kind of from, rather than looking through the telescope, we look through the microscope. And so as we view things that are smaller and smaller and smaller, they're much smaller than our scale, we start to find that we can take atoms and actually theorize about the parts that make up the atom. We're going to discuss this in more detail in a few modules. But if you think of an atom like our solar system, which it's not, but we'll get into that, it has a sun as the nucleus and all these electrons spinning around it, we're going to realize that the nucleus and the electrons are actually stuff. There's, they have matter. It's so incredibly small that it blows your mind to think how small it is. And yet at the same time, between all those pieces of stuff is nothing. And that nothing is not full of air because air is too big. That in the atom, most of the volume is made up of nothing. And everything that is something is made up of the stuff that's mostly nothing. So what is everything? Mostly nothing. You are mostly nothing. I am mostly nothing. This board is mostly nothing. Which is why later when we talk about experiments where they shoot subatomic particles through something that appears to be solid, and the particles go all the way through, and they don't hit anything, it starts to make sense. Because from the view of the particle, it ran into a whole bunch of nothing as it traveled to point A to point B. But to us, it appears to be something because our scale is so much different than their scale. This idea of air having volume and mass, this is a triple beam balance over here. We, 
And let me go ahead and try to adjust this a little bit. You'll all become familiar with this. Has anybody in here used a triple beam before? Okay. So triple beam ballast. So we're going to talk about mass and differentiate in the chapter again. They differentiated between mass and weight. And we'll nuance that in just a moment. But let's focus here. This triple beam balance, and it is a device that we use to measure mass. How much stuff is in something. Let me try to center this thing out a little bit by getting it close to zero. I don't have a lot of confidence we're going to get to nail it, but let's give it a shot. What I'm trying to do is adjust it so that this line matches up with the zero mark on the balance. See, I had it balanced over here, but I forgot to turn it for you all to see it. So that's what I'm doing now. We have to start with it being at approximately zero because if we don't start at zero, our measurements don't have any meaning. Go through and make sure that everything is still set at zero. Sorry if, if this seems... something to consider. It was balanced when it was facing me, but because I turned it, it was enough to throw it off balance. I mean, does it really matter if I get it to zero? We could argue either way. Does it matter when you step on the scale if the scale said zero or if it said 10 when you got on it? For some people, it's huge, right? If you're always measuring at 10, you know, hey, I was at, I was at 210 yesterday, but that means I'm really at 200, so... You, you figure it out in your, in your head. We're talking about numbers here, which are relatively small, and it's not going to help us to just throw that approximation. At a point here, what I'm going to do is just call it quits just for time. And my, my failure for not having adjusted it in the right position before we started. Okay. We're going to end up zeroing it anyway, because all I'm going to really show you is if I take this piece of tape and this balloon, Science has a bu bunch of no-duh moments, okay? No-duh. But it helps you to see it anyway. Let me go ahead and, and try to see if we can adjust this, see how much mass we have. I think I found why we were off. We're, we're just going to see the difference between m two masses, which is why the zero point doesn't have as much significance as it might otherwise. So you can see as I move the weights closer to the left, it's a smaller mass and the balance comes up. It's basically this mass over here on the triple beam is trying to balance out the mass that's laying on top over here. I'm taking the mass of the balloon and the tape because what I'm going to do is take the mass, not weigh, take the mass of the balloon and the tape, and then I'm going to blow up the balloon and take the mass again. And what would you anticipate to find? What do you think is going to happen here? Let's think about it just for a minute. Okay. We're reading 2.42 .42, 2 grams to start. This is actually part of your lab 1.1, so you might want to write the stuff down. So mass initial. 2.42 grams, okay? What I'm saying is the weight of the balloon, the latex balloon, and this piece of tape is 2.42 grams. 2.42, yes, I'm good with that. Now, I'm going to take the balloon off of the triple beam. And I have the tape on there just so after I blow it up, I can tape the balloon to the, to the beam. It'll stay put. could let go of it, but that wouldn't be good. That would be cool. It'd be funny for everybody except the people got hit either with the balloon or my spit, right? That'd be nasty. All right, so we had 2.42 grams. As I put this balloon back on, this, on the triple beam, what do I expect to read? Will it have more, less, or the same mass as I had before? Okay. 
if it were less mass, what I would expect to do happen is if I let go of the balloon right now, would it float or would it drop? It drops, right? Okay. Question is, does the empty balloon have more or less mass than a balloon full of air? If, if this has more mass, that would mean the air has mass, right? If it has less mass, then we have defied the laws of physics. So let's hope that didn't happen because we might actually be in tomorrow. Let's see what happens. Okay, so the triple beam balance is reading above, which means I need to add to get back to zero. And for our purposes, I'm going to call that good at 2.96 grams. It's not close enough. I need to be more precise. Not 2.6, I'm sorry, 2.96. That's what it was. That's why I messed up. 2.96. Mass final. Mass initial, mass final. So I had initial mass of the balloon and the tape of 2.42 grams. I blew up the balloon and took the mass of the balloon, the tape, and the air in the balloon, and I came up with 2.96 grams. How much, how many grams of air are in the balloon? There are 0 0.54 grams of air in that balloon. Because the mass of the entire system initially was balloon and tape, the mass of the entire afterward is the balloon, the tape, and the air. The only thing that's changed is the air. The air makes up the difference. Conservation of mass would say I haven't lost or gained mass from, from nothing. It came from something. It has to come from the air. So. 0 0.54 grams of air is in that balloon. Is it much? No, not really. That's not a lot of matter. It's a gas, right? We're going to learn later on that when you move from solids to liquids to gases, the density changes. This is a very, very little density. There's very little matter per volume for a gas, but it is significant. We do have to account for it. So air does have mass. Does air take up volume? Well, you could look at the balloon and say, has the volume of the balloon changed? Did it change from when, I was, when it was in my hand uninflated to after I inflated it? Yeah, the volume has changed, right? You could barely see it before. Now it's very visible from where we're, you're sitting. Does air take up volume is the second question. If I have this large beaker. This is a tiny one compared to the one I have at home, by the way. This is, this is a cute little beaker. This one, not this one. Okay. By take a simple experiment, you've done this before, little kids in the tub playing with your toys, you've all done this, okay? But now looking at it as more mature scientists, it, it takes on a, a scientific experimental air to it. If I take this beaker and I submerge it, what, 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 describe what happens to the in, what's inside this small beaker? What's going to happen when I push it in here? Water trapped in. Water trapped in the small container. Air trapped in the small container. Okay. Hey, if air is trapped, what does that tell you about what's? All right, little blurb. Can you see the air? See the water line? Since I blurped a little bit, you can probably see a little bit of a water line in the small beaker, right? I mean, this is more dramatic. If I were a 
a Vegas magician or something, I'd ask somebody to give me a $100 bill, but nobody in here has a $100 bill, right? Because I don't have a $100 bill either. I have to put dry Kleenex. And pull the Kleenex up. Hey, it's magic. You know kids doing magic tricks? It's dry. But wait a minute, my hand is wet. Here, wipe off my hand. No, I'm kidding. How is this a Kleenex dry? Didn't I just put it underwater? Right? It was trapped in here because air has volume, and air would not allow the water to take up its volume. It's not going to share that space. It's going to hold the water out. And while it holds the water out, it keeps what's inside of it dry. If I had that Kleenex in here, I decided, you know what? It really doesn't matter. I'd start blur, 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 right? You can see the water line. That water that's invaded the smaller beaker comes from the air that's been evacuated from that beaker. It, it can take up some space, so I can't tip it anymore and get any more out because of the size. But this section up on top of the small beaker, the volume of the air is preventing water from taking that volume. And so air has both mass and volume. And because air has both mass and volume, we're going to study it in chemistry this year as part of our study of chemistry this year. Okay. So we'll talk about what a write-up for those. Those are the equivalents to experiment 1.1 and 1.2 in your text, pages 2 and 3. And we will go through. And you see how, if you read these in advance, you can see how that the text goes through and tells you the purpose of the experiment, what you're going to need. Now, we did it slightly differently. So your, what we used and what we need is going to be different. But you're asking the question on experiment 1.1, does air have mass? On the second one, does air take up space or does it have volume? What you're actually going to do is hypothesize and say, based upon what I understand as of right now, before I do the experiment, do I believe that air has mass? Yes or no. Do I believe that air has volume? Yes or no. You kind of have to put yourself in before we just did it together. Okay. So as you do these in the future, think ahead. What do I think is going to happen? What do I hypothesize? What do I speculate? What's my guess as to what's going to happen? And then run the experiment, and at the end of it go, hey, guess what? I think differently now. Before I thought air didn't have mass, this indicates that it does. Before I thought that air really didn't have volume, guess what? This experiment indicates that it actually does. All right. So in the first one, it's very objective. It's a very quantitative kind of a measure, meaning that I've got hard numbers I look at. I can say, not only do I know that air has mass, but I know that the mass of the air in that balloon is 0 0.54 grams. In the second case, it's more qualitative. It's more subjective. You say, yes, I know air takes up volume. How do you know? Well, not because I displace so many milliliters of volume, but because I put tissue, we put tissue in a beaker and we submerged it underwater. And though the beaker was underwater, the air kept the, the Kleenex dry. So, so that means that something was taking up that volume. The water could not invade that volume. All right? And like I said, we'll go through how to write up this material. This write-up of the material is actually what makes this chemistry with lab, which is what the state requires. Just coming in here and learning chemistry stuff is, is good. It's valuable. It's awesome. But actually doing the labs means you fulfill the state requirements for a science with a lab. And so we have, we're going to be collecting lab write-ups, even the, as simple as that. We did two labs today, but there is a lab write-up for it. Units of measure is where we're at now. Page four, for those of you that may be following along. Talking about units of measure, and he gives an example in here about measuring a window. You know, they, they have those stores like blinds, blindster.com or blinds.com. I don't want to give an ad on, sorry, YouTube. But, you know, they've got these firms that say, you take your measurements you send them to us, and if they're wrong, we'll replace them, even if it's your fault, even if you measured them wrong. Stories about this issue of measurements come up all the time, and we said in here that a number has no meaning without its units. Remember I said that? If I say, give me five, I might mean individuals, but I might mean dozens, or I might mean tons, and there's a huge difference in cost and a huge difference in your storage requirements if you get the units wrong. But also then, when if within units, there's a big difference between unit systems. The dominant system or the predominant system that we're using in chemistry is the metric system. 
because frankly, only folks in the US still sometimes use the English system. And because we work with people all around the world on scientific matters, we submit to the metric system. I'm not saying we shouldn't be using it, I'm just saying if you still think in terms of miles per hour, you're still in the English system. If you think in terms of I weigh so many pounds, well, you really, you know, you're, you're still talking English system. And, and while I think about that, let me go back to what we did over there on the, with the triple beam balance. The triple beam balance, I was able to determine the mass of the air in the balloon, correct? Okay. The way we did that was we used an approximation through weight. And weight and mass are two different things. In the book, they, they recognize the example between here and the moon. If I were here on Earth and I had a particular weight, let's say I weighed 180 pounds here on Earth, and then I were to go to the moon, how much would I weigh on the moon? About one-sixth of what I weigh here, so maybe 30 pounds. So I'd weigh 180 pounds on the Earth, I would weigh 30 pounds on the moon. Question is, do I still have all the same stuff with me that I had on Earth? Are you still the same amount of stuff? I'd argue yes. If you were on Earth, and then we did a Star Trek thing and beamed you to the moon, you would suddenly weigh one-sixth of what you weighed on Earth, but you would still have the same amount of stuff. And so, technically, your mass has not changed. Your weight has changed dramatically. Weight is a measure of gravitational pull on your mass. Okay? Weight is the pull of gravity on your mass. So the more mass you have, the more weight you have. If we've got stick figure man, okay, we've got Earth, we've got the moon, you're on Earth, you weigh 180 pounds, you're on the moon, you weigh 30 pounds. But you're the same person, you have the same amount of stuff. Because what's happening here is the Earth is pulling with the force of gravity, pulling down on you. Over here on the moon, it's a much smaller gravity because it's a much smaller planetary object. It's still pulling down on you, but if you step on a scale, what the scale actually measures is how much the Earth is pulling down on you. What you weigh is how much the planet you're on or body you're on is pulling down on the amount of mass that you have. But you're still the same amount of stuff. The thing that's kind of confusing to us is if I took that triple beam balance and I, or, or another larger unit, let's say, and it was 180 pounds and I figured out how much mass you have, now on the Earth, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So I could divide this by 2.2 pounds and get 80 something kilograms, right? Technically then, I'm gonna approximate, let's say that this is 83 kilograms. If I take 83 kilograms and I go to the moon, you should still have a mass of 83 kilograms. However, even our triple beam balance uses weight to compute mass. So that actual device would still not work. I'd have to count for the change in the gravitational pull, okay? I would have to multiply that by six if I use that same exact device because that's calibrated for use on Earth, okay? So when you think in terms of weight and mass, mass is the amount of stuff that something is, and it doesn't change based upon where it's at. Mass would stay the same. Weight is the gravitational pull of the body that it's on, the planet or the asteroid or whatever you're on, the gravitational pull that object has on the mass that you are or the mass that it is. Is that helpful? The difference is important. Because just like we have pounds for weight, okay, and we've got newtons for force, we've got slugs, we're, we're gonna get into all those different units in just a moment. Some of them sound strange. We will hear even more strange ones in the future. But it's important to know not only that a number has a unit, but make sure we're using the correct units. In the case, like I said, if you looked on page five, there's a, there's a conversation on there about how NASA lost a $7 billion satellite because two different teams of scientists and engineers were using two different unit scales. 
one was using an English system and one was using a metric system. When it came to a critical time in the flight, it didn't work and they lost the satellite and they came later to figure out that, hey, all the numbers were right, they were just in different units. So one team was working metric and one team was working English and poof, for a seven billion dollar satellite. So these things do have consequences. If you're given medication and you're told to take a certain amount, you decide, eh, I can handle more. It has consequences, okay? If the doctor says, here, take one a day and hands you the bottle, and you say, hey, well, where's the bottle for tomorrow? No, I meant one pill a day. Oh, okay, not one bottle a day. Okay, that, that's different. So we're going to be working in the metric system, and if you go over to page six, there's a discussion that starts on the metric system. And the metric system, start at the very top talking about mass. And, and look down the page. You can see, for example, as you're, as you're reading and highlighting that on the, hopefully not highlighting in the book, only I should do that in the book, but reading the book, the fourth line down, you see the word gram there. The unit of mass is the gram. It's in blue. It's telling you, hey, you need to remember this. You need to acknowledge that mass is in grams. This is page six, fourth line down. The unit of mass is the gram in the metric system. And give you the comp the, uh, the way to consider that, that a housefly weighs about a gram. So if you took a housefly and ground it all up, you would have one gram of housefly paste. Um, next paragraph, second, they get into this idea of mass and weight are two different things. That weight measures how hard gravity pulls on the object. Mass is how much stuff. And I will say stuffness. That's just shorthand for mass. You know, the stuff that's in it relates to the mass that's in it. See down at the bottom, they refer to the English unit of mass as the slug. And a slug is not that slimy snail without a shell. It is a unit of, it's the English unit of mass. So if you're working in, if you think pounds, then you've got to think slugs. But we're going to learn that primarily we're going to think in terms of grams. If you look over in table 1-1 one, one on um, page 7, it gives you a table that shows the mass, distance, volume, and time. Let me kind of recreate part of it up here. So you've got mass, distance, volume, and time. Again, I'm copying this mostly for those a few of you that don't have the text yet. The rest of you go, yeah, I can see that right in my book. Okay, that's cool. But for those that don't, this is what we're talking about. So this is metric in English. Don't worry, my handwriting will start to make more sense. I try. We'll, we'll work it out. Okay, this chart's going to show the base units. The base unit means the primary units. When we talk about, for example, mass, and we're looking when we're considering the metric system, the mass is going to be in grams. So I'll write a gram here. And that's a, symbolized by a lowercase g. So mass is in grams. Whereas in the English system, mass is in slugs. So I'll write a slug here. And it's abbreviated SL. Now, you're not going to need to memorize all of these. I don't believe. Oh, actually, he does say, yes, memorize the table. Okay. So mass is in grams or slugs, Gs or SLs. Distance is in meters, abbreviated with the lowercase m. And what is distance in English? Foot. Well, how long is a foot? How do you think the unit of a foot came to be initially? Where do we get the idea of a foot from? Think real hard. The length of the king's foot. The length of the king's foot was the distance of a foot. Okay, that's how it used to be. What happens when they get a new king? You thought you had five and a half feet of something, but guess what? New king has small feet. You now have eight feet of something. And we tax you by the foot. <laughs> okay? So if you've got something that is your standard, but the standard is always changing, you really don't have a standard, do you? 
Now they've standardized what a foot is, and you realize that the Smithsonian Institution, that they have the standard foot. They have a rod that is w exactly one foot long. And when somebody says, well, how long is a foot? It's 12 inches. Well, how long is an inch? It's, it's one twelfth of a foot. Well, wait a minute, you haven't answered my question. How long is a foot? Let's go to the Smithsonian. We'll pull out the rod and we'll lay it down and go, this is a foot. This is exactly a foot. Why? There is one rod that is the standard, not the king's foot anymore, that standardizes what a foot is. But the concept is kind of like a foot. Somebody had to once say, okay, this is a foot and forever this is going to be a foot and from now on an inch is one twelfth of this and a meter, well, never mind, a yard is three of these and go from that point on. Volume. We look at the balloon. It had a small volume and it had a larger volume, right? It changed volumes. In the metric system, the unit is a liter. It's abbreviated with a capital L. The volume in the English system, we buy milk by the gallon, right? Gallons is the unit of volume in the English system. Yep. Abbreviated with gal. Unit of time. Guess what? This one they share. This one they have in, in common. They use seconds. Second and a second, abbreviated with the lowercase s in both cases. Okay. So if I were to ask you to determine the volume of that balloon, but I haven't told you what system to use, you would either come back with an answer to me that is in liters or potentially gallons, right? They're both units of volume. They just represent units within different systems. In the metric system, we'd expect to use these units. In the English system, we would use these units. Now, there are times when the issue becomes one of scale. They use this idea in the, in the book that if I wanted to figure out the distance from, let's say, the length of this board from one edge to the other, and they look over here and say the distance unit is meters or feet, that kind of makes sense. Would it make sense for me to say, give me, the dis give me the length of this board in miles? Could I do it? I, I could figure out a number, right? I could tell you how many miles long this board is. It would be a small number. It would be much less than one. But I could give you the length of this whiteboard in miles. I could give you the length of this board in kilometers. I could give you, you know, find really long units. I could... I can, I can do it, but does it really make sense? Also, would it make sense to give you the length of this board in millimeters? Okay. Usually we try to find a unit system that fits in a number that we can comprehend that's comparable to the length. And so when we're talking about the distance from here to the sun, and I ask you to figure out the distance, would it make sense for you to come back with how many inches it is from you to the sun? Probably not. It's going to be a huge number that the number itself is going to blow you away, and then you're going to say so many bazillion inches. Okay, give me something that makes more sense. We talk about light years then. Well, what's that? The distance that light can travel in a year, but then your numbers come down to like four, five, six, seven, something we can actually comprehend. And there's going to be a couple of things like that we talk about in chemistry where the units are so big or so small that we need to put them in something that we can actually start to imagine we can actually start to work with because they're either too small or too big and we just can't comprehend things in that range and in that scale. So finding units that are appropriate for whatever this issue is. If we're distance from here to the moon, for example, we could do it in miles. It's going to be a big number. Light years would be a small number. Inches would be a massive number. But they could all really be, this, they could all equal each other. They could be what might be known as units of identity, which is important if we get into the next section where we talk about manipulating units. Because whenever we start to talk about using different units, if we talk about distances, let's say, what are some of the other distance units I've just mentioned? We have feet. We also, what other ones do we know in the English system? If I measured something, I could be in feet, it could be in 
a little louder. Yards, okay, so I could measure it in yards. And what, how much is a yard? Three feet. So it'd be feet times three equals yards, okay? What other distance units do I have in English, in the English units system? We have miles, okay? How long is a mile? Correct, yes ma'am. So it'd be feet times, actually it'd be Technically, I made an error. It's not feet times three, it's feet divided by three, wouldn't it be? How many feet divided by three would be yards? Over here, it would be feet divided by 5,000, 5,280. So if I have 5,280 feet, I can convert that and say I've got one mile. Okay. But see, in order to go from feet to yards, you've got to remember that the the multiplier is three, or the divisor is three. And to go from feet to miles, you need to remember 5,280. And these seem rather odd because our minds don't work in multiples of three. I mean, how many people in here go around counting base 16 all the time? Are you familiar with base 16? It's a number system. It goes one, two, well, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, and then starts over again. Base 10 goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. So hexadecimal, base 16, has a different counting paradigm. It, it moves differently, and you've got to remember the paradigm. You've got to remember the rule for the language you're speaking or the, for the units you're changing. And here, when it goes from feet to yards, you've got to remember something to do with three. It's either multiplied by three or divided by three, but three is key. Going from feet to miles or miles to feet, somehow 5,280 is significant. I've got to remember 5,280 and either multiply or divide by that to go from one to the other. Okay. We have the same thing here with gallons. You can have gallons, but you can also, like I used milk as an example, you can buy milk by the gallon, but you can also buy milk by the half gallon, which is easy, right? Divide, divide or multiply by two, can, by the pint, by the cup, by the quart, by the ounce. By the quart, it's multiply or divide by four. By the pint, it's multiply or divide by eight. By the ounce, you know, you, you've got to remember all these different numbers in order to do the conversions from one to the other. What's the beauty about the metric system? Everything is a multiplier divided by something that's a base 10. That's how we think, right? It's a base 10 conversion, and it all happens through use of a prefix. So for those of you with your texts on page 8, there's a table that shows the most common prefixes that are used in the metric system. From micro all the way up to mega. Now, there's only three of them that we're going to require to memorize, and that's milla, cente, and kilo, abbreviated with a M, A, C, and K, all lowercase. Milla, centa, and kilo. What you're expected to know is that a milla represents one one thousandth. One thousandth. That's where the, the all the different phonemes are important. One one thousandth of whatever it precedes. Centa is one one hundredth. And kilo is 1,000. So, if we're talking about mass, and we say our base unit is a gram, and I say I need to have your answer in kilograms, 
Well, we know that kilo is always either a multiplier divided by a thousand. Kilo technically means one thousand of whatever it is. If I'm looking at grams, well, a kilogram is how many sets of one thousand grams do you have? If I say a centigram, it's how many sets of one one hundredth do you have? You know, or in milligrams, how many sets of one one thousandth of a gram do you have? Knowing these three, actually knowing all of these, but these in particular, by knowing what the prefix means, I now can construct any scale using the metric system. I can have a milligram, a centigram, a kilogram. I can have a millimeter, a centimeter, and a kilometer. I can have a milliliter, a centiliter, and a kiloliter. And I can also have a millisecond, a centisecond, and a kilosecond. They're all different scales, but they're all using the same base unit. And because I only have to memorize it one time over here, and because it's base 10, it makes the math so much easier. For example, tomorrow we're going to start talking about manipulating units. Manipulating units, or converting between units, rather, on page 9. So what does this mean? We said before, if we have a distance, let's say we have 3.5 miles. And I know that one mile is 5,000. One mile equals 5,280 feet. And I want to convert from miles to feet. What do I have to do? Well, we'll learn that I have so many miles, and I need to take my statement of equality. If I ask you which is larger, one mile or 5,280 feet, which is larger? They're the same, right? If I take something and I divide it by the same thing, what's my answer? If I take 5 and divide it by 5, what's my answer? If I take 17 divided by 17, what's my answer? If I take anything and divide it by something of equal value, it's actually equal to 1. We get that? If I take 1 mile and divide it by 5,280 feet, we're dividing the same things, different names for the same thing. And mathematically, that's going to come out to be equal to 1. But because it's different units, we need to account for that in some way. So we've got 3.5 miles, and I want to convert it to feet. I'm going to create a fraction that I multiply by, and this is called the unit conversion factor. I have miles on the top, so I need miles on the bottom. And I'm trying to solve for feet, so that has to go on the top. I look over here and I say, hey, one mile is worth 5,280 feet. Now conceptually, multiplying by this fraction, does it change the value? No. I'm not changing the value. I'm changing the number. But I'm changing the number because I'm changing my units. See what happens? Miles cancels miles, and I'm left with feet. 3.5 times 5,280 is going to give me how many, how many um, feet am I looking at. 3.5 times 5,280 is how many feet I have in 3.5 miles. Now, if I'm looking over here at the metric system, and I have, let's say, 3.5 kilometers, kilometers, 3.5 kilometer, right? How many meters is this? Well, I could go through and do the same thing and go, okay, well, one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters. Kilometers cancels kilometers and multiply 3.5 times 1,000. But what's the beauty about multiplying by a base 10 number? What's the shortcut for base 10 multiplication? Do you remember? Slide the decimal place. I'm going to slide the decimal place. How many places? Three places because there are three trailing zeros. So I've got one and three zeros. So when I multiply something by 10, I move it over one. When I multiply by 100, I move it over two. And when I multiply by 1,000, I move it three. I make it larger by moving it three places. Well, if I start with 3.5, and just for fun, I'm going to put a bunch of trailing zeros and say, OK, I've got to move the decimal place three places, making it larger by three. One, two, three. There's my new decimal place. Three thousand five hundred meters. The metric system, because it is base 10, if we know what the words represent or what the symbols represent, we can do the math very quickly, very readily by simply moving the decimal place. 
So 3.5 kilometers is the same as 3,500 meters. I can do that very quickly because all I'm doing is sliding the decimal place. Okay? So not only does the metric system provide us the opportunity to work with scientists from other countries because we're speaking the same language and the same units, but mathematically it's so much easier. So much easier than converting everything to gallons, let's say, and then figuring out how many ounces that is or how many quarts that is or how many cups that is or how many whatever.